Good morning, everyone. Hey, all right. Welcome to AnacondaCon. I'm Mike from State Farm. Yeah, see, that's, that's a free laugh. I'm going to take that one. All right, so hey, today I'm going to talk about this thing called transfer learning, which is going to be something that you can use to make your models better um, with less data. And I think that's going to be exciting. And also I'm going to talk about what we can do um, so I'm going to talk about how to use it. But lastly, I'm going to talk about uh, some new research that my team did that is, I think, pretty interesting. Uh, it goes to uh, how much you can get away with with transfer learning. So we'll talk about that in just a second as well. So here's the thing. Computer vision is everywhere, right? And I, I'm sure I don't have to tell you guys that, but I will anyway. Um, so I'm lucky enough, I get to work with a team of about 30 data scientists that's distributed all across the United States, uh, Atlanta, uh, Dallas, Phoenix, of course, beautiful metropolitan Bloomington, Illinois. Um, and, and those folks have, on average, I would say between two and four computer vision projects going on at any given time. We use computer vision all the time. It's important for our enterprise. There's a lot of, a lot of problems that computer vision solves. Uh, outside of State Farm, uh, there's even probably more interest in computer vision, right? This goes anywhere from self-driving cars and, you know, crazy things like that to this awesome app on my, on my phone that can tell me if I'm looking at a hot dog or not, right? And so computer vision's everywhere. It's pervasive. And so here's the recipe for doing computer vision really well, or deep learning in general, but computer vision especially. Have a model architecture that has millions of parameters. The more parameters, probably the better. And then have a GPU that can crunch that model, right? That can run, that, run on those, those millions of parameters. And then the last one is just have lots and lots and lots of data. Piece of cake. That's it. That is deep learning success. This is a, a quote that I like from a paper that Google wrote. Um, it's this paper, they recently wrote it, it's called Revisiting the Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data in the Deep Learning Era. And what they say is that performance on vision tasks increases logarithmically based on the volume of training data. So let me ungeek that for you. More, more data is always good, right, is what they're saying, logarithmically. But data is rarely plentiful. Um, so back in 2013, this is, a, this is a fun story that I have about data, uh, I had this, this desire to build a model, and this model was going to be telling us, it was going to tell me um, the relative damage of a car, right? So I was going to take a photo of a car, and I was going to know how broken it was. Seems like a thing that an insurance company would care about, surprise. Um, and, and so to do that, I, want, I needed a bunch of pictures of cars. So we had a bunch of pictures of cars, good news. But the pictures of cars that we had were um, not really collected for this purpose. So you can imagine that as a car were um, damaged, a, an adjuster might take a picture of where the damage is, but they might also take a picture of like all the undamaged places and just kind of around. And so what would end up was, how this would end up is we would have in our uh, computer, in our database, we'd have all of this, uh, all of these images that were like, well, Here's a car that, was, that we had a claim on, and here's a broken bit. Here's a not broken bit. Here's like a selfie of the adjuster. Here's the adjuster's, adjuster's thumb, right? And so, and so that was, it was tough, and I get it. It's no one's fault because the database that we're using was never built for a computer vision application. No one ever thought that this was going to feed a computer vision thing. Um, and so, so that's the struggle, right? And I've learned two important lessons in my adult life. The first one is that the data is always a mess. The second one is never trust the wine pairing. But that has nothing to do with this presentation. <laughs> so what I did to overcome this problem was I went to Walmart, as any good Midwesterner does, and I purchased a bunch of Matchbox cars, and I took pictures of them on various backgrounds and in various orientations, and then I broke them, and I took more pictures and I broke them more, and I took more pictures. And that was the data set for our very first computer vision model. Since then, we've worked out, sorted the issue around, um, around training data. That's no longer as big of a problem for us. However, 
right? Getting started, data is hard. The data quality is always a mess, and data is not always plentiful. So what happens to a really data-starved deep neural network? What's, what, what's going to happen? What happens if we don't have enough images? I found this data set on um, Kaggle, and I really liked it for this, for this case, this use case, because it's this total edge case of not enough data. So it's called the um, 10 Monkey Species data set. It's one of the open data sets on Kaggle. And it has um, 10 classes of monkeys, right? Who doesn't like monkeys? And um, every one of them has about 130 training images and about 20 to 30 validation images. This is not enough data. This is like the definition of not enough data. So what happens if we build a convolutional neural network using this? Let's find out. So I built this network, and what it is is it's, this is like the very most basic convolutional network that could kind of fit, like could kind of uh, learn. Um, I built, built this network. It's um, 128 uh, filters, 64 filters, 32, 16, a 1024 unit fully connected layer, and a 10 unit softmax. So this is very basic. It's, as far as parameters go, it's smaller than probably one, one block of the inception uh, in Google's inception model. All right, so let's look at what happens. So you can see that as we train, um, the epics are kind of on the x-axis here, and then on the y-axis you have the uh, loss or the accuracy. Uh, the, you can see that as we train through epics, we see that the loss is going down. That's good. We want the loss to go down. But we see the validation loss after about, I don't know, six, eight epics, it's going up, right? And so that means that while we are fitting the training set very well, we're not, no longer fitting the validation set well. And this is what we call in the t industry overfitting, right? This is a high variance model. We're overfitting the training set too well. So sort of the definition of overfitting. Uh, and so if you look at that on the accuracy side, you have sort of the same thing where you're almost approaching 100% accuracy on the training set. However, on the validation set, we're kind of bumping around 65, 60% accuracy. So uh, our network's overfitting. And that's what happens when you don't have enough data. So... That's where we can get into transfer learning, which is more fun than a barrel full of monkeys. I'm sorry the, for the monkey puns. It's really, I, I can't control myself. It's a thing. And so here's how transfer learning works. What you do is you build a, a, a CNN, a deep network, on some really plentiful data set, right? So you have like some really big data set and a lot of labels, and it's good quality, and it's kind of a known data set. And you can train your model on that and you get it to be the best that you can get it. And then what you do is you kind of take that model and you transfer its learning to the target domain from the source domain. And that target domain is gonna be a place that you probably have less data and you're probably gonna have less labels. But what you can do then is you can take all of that learning that you gathered from that source data, um, that source problem, and transfer it to the target problem. Cool, right? Um, and so this is typically done with like a really big network like, um, like typically it's like the ResNets or the Inceptions, those kind of, those kind of like really fancy, many layers, state of the art kind of network. And we typically train them on something called uh, ImageNet, which is like 10 million images across a thousand labels. And then our, you know, you can imagine then that this really deep network the kind of the lower layers, they start to learn how to see, they learn how to recognize images, they learn these low level features. And then when we transfer this over to the target model, we can kind of preserve all of that learning to see to the new problem. And so I'm gonna kind of walk you through that. But basically, there's two important steps to transfer learning. The first one is called feature extraction. And the second one's called fine tuning, and it's sort of optional. Um, but we're going to cover it here because I think it's cool. It gives you that last little bump um, that's going to make your network perform just that much better. So feature extraction. Here's how you do it. You start with a very robust model that's been already trained on a large data set. And we're going to call that the source problem domain. This is that, that ImageNet train, or that Inception trained on ImageNet I was talking about. Um, and then what you do is you take the last layer of the network, so like the softmax layer that decides what classes things are, throw it away. You don't need that. You might even throw away some of the fully connected layers underneath that. 
throw those away too. And then what you're going to do is you're going to replace those with your own fully connected layers. You're going to stick in your own softmax, your own fully connected layer, brand new. Right? And you kind of splice this network together. It's sort of Frankenstein between the this, this source network and now what you want. All right. And then what you do is um, and you build those networks, you build those last layers spe specifically for your target problem, your target domain. And so then what you want to do is you want to freeze all of the, th the layers that have already learned on the um, source domain, and we want to only train the target domain, the, the new stuff that we added. And then we're going to go ahead and train on that target domain problem. And that's feature extraction. I'm going to show you this in code. This is what it looks like. In the, so here I'm using Keras, uh, which is, in my opinion, a really easy to use deep learning library that sits on top of um, TensorFlow or, you know, I guess CNTK if you wanted to do that. Um, and, and so what it does is it makes it really easy to add some, to, to do this kind of feature extraction. Uh, so this function is kind of everything you need to do feature extraction for the monkey problem. What it does is we load the base model using a Keras AP, uh, application. And Keras applications are pre-trained networks, networks that have already been trained on a source do data or source domain. I'm going to use Inception v3. I'm going to use the image net weights. And I'm going to say include top equals false. And what that means is I don't even have to throw away those top layers because they're smart and they know what I want to do. So they're going to do that for me. They're going to throw those away. And we're ready to start doing our transfer learning. I'm going to take that as kind of the start of my network. I'm going to add this thing called a global averaging 2D layer. And all that does is it just makes sure that whatever comes out of that network is going to be a 2D tensor so I can go right into a fully connected layer. I'm going to add a fully connected layer with 1,024 neurons. And this is, so this is a brand new layer. And then lastly, I'm going to add a softmax layer that has 10 units. And those 10 units are going to give me the softmax probabilities of, or the softmax output of each class of monkey. Why 10? Because there's 10 monkey classes. If there were 11 monkeys, we'd use 11. OK, so we wire that all together. We add those new layers onto our transfer network. And we call that entire thing a model. And then we go ahead, and you can see at the very bottom here, I'm, I say for layer and base model dot layers, those layers are trainable false. So I'm saying don't train those layers, right? And then last, we compile the entire thing. I'm using RMS prop here, but you can use, you know, whatever you want. Um, and there we go. That, this model now is ready for transfer learning. So you can take this and apply it to the monkey data set. But that's not all. I'm going to also show you how fine-tuning works. And fine-tuning is a really cool technique for when um, you need that last little bump in performance, or there's another special reason that you might want to use it. I'll talk about later on, but I don't want to give my best stuff away yet. Um, so here's how fine-tuning works. You're going to start with the network that we had in the last slide, the feature extraction one. We're going to have trained that already, right? We've gotten the very best trained model we can out of that. And then we're going to thaw some or all of those convolutional layers. And then we're going to train again, making only really small updates. And here's why I'm doing that. As you can imagine, in, in the beginning, when we were doing feature extraction, if I also allowed the, the um, parameters of the underlying base model to move, then when, in those first couple of epochs when the uh, new spliced in layers didn't know anything, you would just, like, you would get all kinds of garbage happening, pushing back down to all the convolutional layers. You don't want that. It'd be kind of a hot mess. So we froze it. Now, our feature extraction layers know something, and they may know something that could improve the underlying convolutional layers. This is like maybe, hey, I, I know that you know all this stuff from the source domain, but you might want to also consider these things that we learned in the target domain. So we'll unthaw a little bit or all of the, of the convolutional layers, and then we'll train again. We're going to use a really, really small learning rate here because we don't want to take too big of a bite or we'll have a bad time. And that's what this looks like in code. So this is a, another function. And this function takes as an argument the previous model. And it also takes a learning rate, which is going to be the learning rate for stochastic gradient descent, and then momentum for the same. 
And what it does is it slices, you're gonna have to trust me on this, but layer 249 is like the last convolutional layer in the Keras Inception V3 model. Um, and what I'm saying here is everything before that last convolutional layer, we're still not gonna train. That last convolutional layer, hey, let's train that too. Uh, this is a judgment call. You can train all the layers, you can train none of the layers. It's a hyperparameter, search it, I don't know. Um, so anyway, you do that. Uh, we're gonna compile this model again using stochastic gradient descent and return it, and now this model is ready for another round of training where it will hopefully improve over the original feature extraction model. Make sense? Cool. So, let's monkey around a little bit with Inception V3 using feature extraction. So this is my res the results on the same data set using only feature extraction. So you can see that my loss is going down as it did last time, hooray. My validation loss is going down and it tracks more or less the loss. There's no overfitting going on here. Good news. Same thing on accuracy. Accuracy is going up, validation accuracy for the most part going up. We pushed it maybe a little bit too far, but we're pretty good. So TLDR, 96% validation accuracy using transfer learning. Uh, when we were not using transfer learning, 65%. This is an edge case. You won't experience this kind of lift all the time but, um, you know, extreme example to make an extreme point. Uh, way more layers here, right? So we're able to train on a much more complex network because we have the benefit of all the source domain training data to keep that overfitting away. And then, yeah, so we're not overfitting, hooray. So then let's move on to feature, or fine tuning. So that was the feature extraction performance. Here's the fine tuning performance. So now we've already hit like 96% accuracy, and can we improve it? And so I trained for 20 more epics. Um, by the way, before I move on, it's something I should have told you about. That feature extraction network, um, the one that I'm showing you, uh, because the data is small, and because I only have to train a 1024 fully connected layer and, a, um, and then a softmax, like so relatively few parameters to train relatively small data, I was able to run that on my Mac. Like, I didn't need to do that on AWS. So there's a great benefit to computation um, in, in computational performance and in, in transfer learning as well that makes it worth considering, even if you do have enough data. Um, okay, so fine tuning. We took the feature extraction model. We moved to unfroze the last convolutional layer. We're doing some more training. We're gonna go another 20 epics. And in this case, um, we see loss still going down. It's, the scales here are a lot smaller, guys. Um, validation loss also still going down. We do about as good as we can after, you know, 12 or so. Uh, accuracy, same deal. Um, accuracy just sort of bounces around, but validation accuracy, you can see that accuracy does it, it occasionally hit like 100%, right? And so you've probably at that point squeezed all the juice you're gonna get out of that orange, right? Like this. <laughs> There's just not much left to get you. Um, and so then validation accuracy, uh, after about eight epics, it, like, it goes up and then it stays there. It's good, right? And so we go from like nine, um, you know, I don't know, I want to call that like 965 to all the way to 98, and it kind of stays there. So again, TLDR, fine tuning, um, almost 98% accuracy on the same problem where we started with 65%. Still way more layers, still not overfitting, right? So fine tuning, feature extraction, incredibly powerful technique to make your computer vision models better. So whenever I'm doing a computer vision problem, um, I inevitably have this like the same conversation. And this conversation is, I go into the, the business partner and they're like, hey, they're like, hey, I have this computer vision problem I need you to solve. And I'm like, okay, cool. And, and I say, um, you know, what data do you have? And they say, well, we have this. And, and in, inevitably they say, well, how much data do you need? And I say, well, I don't know. How much data do you have? And it's this race condition. Um, because of what we had previously talked about, right? Like, more data is always good. So one of the things we were curious about was, in transfer learning, how much data do you need? Right? What impact does data volume have on performance in transfer learning? So um, my colleagues, Yun Tao Li, Ding Chao Zhang, and myself decided to do a little bit of research, and we wrote a paper on this just recently. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, that paper is called Investigating the Impact of Data Volume and Domain Similarity on Transfer Learning Applications. 
academic papers are not brief. Um, right, so what we did was we took, uh, we went out to Kaggle again, we got the, a couple of data sets. One of them was the cats versus dogs data set. If you're used to that, it's, or seen that before, it's like 20, 25,000 pictures of cats and dogs, like 12,500 cats, 12,500 dogs. It's a, it's a classification, binary classification problem. Is this a cat, is this a dog? And so what we did was then we broke the, the data set up into lots of data sets starting at like 1,000 pictures and then incrementally going up like 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 until we're out of data. That's the output of this, this graph. And so what you can see is on the x-axis, the amount of data that we had, and the y-axis, the performance. And our uh, findings more or less held with what we saw with the Google paper on source domain, right? More data always helped until we were out of data. Logarithmically, right, so, but yeah, more data always helps. And so, this is, you know, this is uh, kind of the, the premise is that while data is not av available and you may only get to have so much data, always take more if they're offering it. Okay. So then there's one other interesting idea that we wanted to explore. And that, is, that idea is this. How much does it matter when you're transferring between a source domain and a target domain? How much does it matter that the source and the target are similar or not? And so... Uh, what we did was we took um, the MIT Places database, which is like primarily like architecture, it's like buildings, and that was, uh, that was a source domain that we trained on, and then we wanted to transfer to VGG faces, which is face, people's faces, right? And we did that because those were like the two most different things we could think of that, you know, were out there in the public domain. Um, and what we found out was that to achieve kind of a comparable result to a similar d target and source, you needed a lot more data, right? Obviously. This is not surprising, but it's confirmed. Um, and then the other thing is, is that fine-tuning matters way more when your source and your target are very different from each other, right? So as you can imagine, if your source domain is buildings and your target domain is faces, um, the underlying layers before the softmax, before that last fully connected layer, all of those convolutional layers, they have a lot to learn about the target domain that they probably don't know because they've never seen a face before, they've only ever seen a building. On the other hand, when the source and target are very similar, you can get away with a lot more. And that's what we're doing, I believe, in the monkey problem that I showed you today. Source and target are very similar, and so we're able to get really pretty darn good results from just a very few images. And really, honestly, fine tuning benefited us a little bit, but not too much, which is typical when source and target are the same. Okay, so in case you were just totally redditing and, and forgot all the rest of this, here's kind of my wrap up. So this is what you can take back to your boss and be like, no, I was really paying attention, I swear. Um, <laughs> it's okay, I understand. I understand, I do the same thing. So here's the thing, more data is always good, but data is often in short supply. Transfer learning helps when data is in short supply, but honestly, transfer learning helps all the time, almost all the time, I shouldn't say all the time. Um, it's really easy to implement transfer learning, I think I showed you that here, I hope you saw that. Um, you can find all of the code for this example, which is, as far as I know, working um, on my GitHub, which is there. Um, github.com slash Mike Bernico, uh, and I'm sure that the links will be available somewhere. Um, source and target dom similarity, domain similarity, it really matters. And hey, one last plug, uh, if you want more practical examples of this, you can check out the book I just wrote, Deep Learning Quick Reference. <laughs> right. Okay, so um, that is what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. I have a few more minutes that I can take questions. Um, if there's any questions, say it, and I'll try to repeat it instead of running a mic. Is that